Hi, sweet people. I'm Gazina Prado, and I have been mixing up dough all day so that we can party, party, party with the honey bun dough that I made with platinum yeast from Red Star. But first, let's go to some really fun and exciting things. Now, I'm gonna be demonstrating with my honey bun dough, and you can see that bake along video on the Red Star site. So go to redstaryeast.com backslash platinum, and then you'll see how to make the dough. I have a whole video on it. And then you'll see links to making different things with the dough, buns, honey bunnies, and babka. So that dough video is waiting for you, and I'm gonna show you things that you can make with the dough today. And if you have questions, you can ask them. If we don't get to them, this will still be living on the internet. So you can continue asking questions and they will be answered, I promise. And let's talk about the yeast though, because I know that flour and yeast are pretty hard to get. And so what I suggest you do is that you go online onto the Red Star site and there is a store finder there. So put in your zip code and it'll tell you where the nearest store is that carries platinum from Red Star and just be patient i know this is really tough for all of us that it's so hard to get the things that are most important toilet paper flour and yeast but they are coming your way they're winging your way they're doing their best to get them stocked up in stores um, and soon enough you'll be baking like a pro now speaking of baking like a pro let's bake honey bunnies like a pro so i already baked the honey bunnies so if you go to red star yeast backslash platinum You'll see the bake along, and there's also a video of how I formed my honey bunnies, which I love so much. And sometimes I will pipe their little faces with ganache, but even easier, and this is really fun because when you make a large batch of these, you have a lot of bunnies. I know. And then you grab, let's see, a skinny one. And then you just make two little eyeballs. One, two, and its little mouth. Isn't that adorable? And your kids are gonna have so much fun if you make these. It's really fun to shape this dough with kids. And then once they have cooled down, you kind of want to have them nice and cool before you start marking them up. Then you can use the markers to make really cute faces on them. And the other thing about shaping these is that it might seem that the ears are gonna be more like breadsticks and this will be softer. This dough is so soft, it's all supple. It's all pillowy and delicious. So this is going to be like three rolls in one when you form them. And then they're also stinking adorable, which is crucial in life right now. So the other thing that we can make, aside from rolls, those are the honey buns and the honey bunnies with the ears, is babka and babka is just this wonderful bread made with a yeasted dough right obviously but usually it's enriched so it will have things like eggs butter and sugar and when you are making a dough that's yeasted that has those extra kinds of ingredients it's called an enriched dough oftentimes that yeast has a little bit of a hard time working because there's so much stuff interfering that sugar is making it go crazy the fat is impeding it from working but with platinum the lovely thing about it is that it works through all those hardships so easily it makes working with these kinds of doughs really simple uh, the other thing that i do is i line my pan when you have an enriched dough that also has a filling that can get sticky as it bakes. Sometimes it's really hard to release it from the pan. So what I do is I line it with parchment so that it doesn't stick. And it also makes it so much easier to lift the dough, the whole loaf, straight from the pan just by picking it up. However, I do a little extra step. I don't bake with these on there, but I put these little clips on the side because I am not the most coordinated bunny. So when I end up rolling the dough and putting it in, if I don't secure the sides before I put it in, it all caves in and I'm sitting there like a crazy person trying to get the parchment out. So I secure it that way so I can easily put it in. Don't forget to get rid of the clips before you put it in the oven. But you've got a while. It needs to proof after you put it in. So that's there waiting for me. And now I have my dough. 
So this is the milk bread dough from which I make the honey buns and the honey bunnies and now babka, babka. And I made it earlier today. I cleaned up, I swear, took off my sweatpants, put on some makeup. I felt like a new woman and I'd made my dough and I chilled it. And this is kind of a crucial thing with this kind of dough. If you have made this already, you'll know that it's just such a soft, beautiful dough. You just want to pet it, but it's really hard to work with when it is warm. So what you do, like a brioche dough, any enriched dough, if you cool it down, that butter seizes and it just makes it so much easier to work with. So what you can do, you can do one of two things. You can let it rise for an hour. It's called the, the bulk ferment. And then you can put it in the fridge for about an hour to cool down. Or you can make the dough at night and put it in there immediately overnight and work with it in the morning because it will rise really slowly when it's cold. And then it'll be ready for you to work with the next day. So I have my cool dough in my bowl. And when you put it in the bowl, I always make sure that I oil the bowl and then I oil the top of it too. Otherwise it will form a skin and it will get crackly. So this is like nice and pillowy right now. I'm going to knock that puppy down in a second. And then before I do anything, I'm going to dust my bench with flour. Now this is officially called bench flour. And all bench flour is, is flour that you take out of the container and you put it in a bowl so that you don't get your grubby hands and your clean container for the flour. And I was teaching once at King Arthur Flour and after the class, the student went to the store and he said, I would like to buy a bag of the bench flour. And they laughed at him, but I thought that was the cutest thing ever because it is special. It's something that sits on the side and it's just meant for dusting your bench. And so the way I do it, some people, when they dust the bench, instead of dusting, they put little piles on there. They go boop, boop, boop. So all you get are big piles in sections and the rest of it is bare. So you're going to stick here and you're going to have too much flour there. So what I do is I take a nice big pinch, palm up, and I keep it pinched, and I'm just using my wrist to, to gently dust. And you know, it just looks cool. So once in a while, I'll get someone to uh, get your iPhone and do this in slow-mo, and you'll feel like a rock star. So just dust, right? Even coating, you don't want too much. You don't want to add too much flour to this. You just want to make sure that it's not sticking to your bench. And now I'm going to take my dough and I'm going to degas it because it's got all those bubbles that's been fermenting. And so the yeast has been munching, 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 and then it's been like blowing bubbles essentially. So it's gotten nice and big. And so we're going to punch it down and it's going to be easier obviously to work with if it is flatter. And I'm going to roll it out into a rectangle. Now, the measurement really depends on your pans. And what this will do is it will make two babkas in a pan this size or your regular loaf size, or it'll make one large one if you have a Pullman loaf pan. Stay there, I'll show you what that looks like. This is a Pullman loaf. It's very long, so you can make a really long babka from that, or you can make two with the smaller loaves. And what you're going to do as you're rolling it out, you're going to gauge how wide these are. So you'll double it for this, or sometimes if I'm just using this one, I'll be rolling with this to the side to see how wide I need to make it. And then I'm also going to dust the top of this ever so slightly. And then my pin as well. And I can already tell how much easier it is to work with this dough when it's cold because it's actually paying attention to me and it's not sticking. It also sticks a lot less when it is cool. And if you have any questions, my husband Ramo, he is on camera and so he will be trying every once in a while to check out those questions as we go along. But forgive us if we can't because he's doing two things at once. So I'm rolling this out and every once in a while I'll pick it up and I'll stretch it just to make sure that it's not sticking. If it is sticking to your bench, then it can tear the dough. And also what you'll notice that if it is sticking as you're rolling, obviously if it's not moving, it's probably sticking. But something else that happens that as you're going forward, you'll notice that in front of your pin, it will start bunching up 
The second that starts happening, take off your pen, lift it up, put a little more flour underneath. So what we're looking for is long enough to fill either two pans or one large Pullman and tall enough that when we roll it up, it has lots of lovely layers of filling. And the filling is, in this case, chocolate and almond. Whoa, my favorite. You can just make chocolate. Uh, you can kind of go crazy with the fillings that you like, Nutella, cookie butter. I mean, right now, just use what you have in your cupboard. And the recipe for the fillings are on the Red Star site. So go to redstaryeast.com backslash platinum. I also think on this link right now, there are links to the actual recipes for the filling right there for you. Gosh, technology is so convenient. So this, those are my recipes. I'm like, yay, I'm gonna put them up. But now, the world being what it is, I couldn't find some ingredients so I had to make do with what I had. So for instance, I couldn't find chocolate. I can't find chocolate anywhere. What's going on? Not the kind that I like, but I had cocoa. So instead of the, the paste that uses the chocolate itself, I combined a stick of unsalted butter that was soft, uh, one third cup of Dutch cocoa, and one half cup of sugar. And I just mixed it up into a paste. And this is what it looks like. And it actually worked incredibly well because it's very soft and I could just, mm, it's really tasty. And you can very easily, can you see how dark that is? I have a very dark, it's really easy to just smear all over the place onto the babka. And then traditionally I will use something that is more like a frangipan, which is an almond filling that you can pipe on there. And I didn't have all the ingredients for that. So instead I made a little marzipan with one and a half cups each of confectioner sugar and almond flour, one egg white and like just a little bit of almond extract. And then I rolled both of them together like this. First the marzipan and then I smeared that chocolate over it. And I'm gonna look to see if this is the right size. It needs to be a little bigger. And I didn't put it in the refrigerator because I didn't want it to get crackled and cold. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to easily transfer the two here. I say that now. I say easily. Let's see what happens. Let's see how easy, right? So what I do, drum roll please, I take this, I just plop it over, and I center it as best as I can, and I peel this off. If I've done a good job, it won't stick. Ta-da! And this is a great sign that I have a little gap here between the filling and the dough. I wanna see the little dough peeking out because if you have too much filling reaching all the way to the edges, it'll start leaking out and make it really sticky when you're trying to get it out of the pan. So it's good to have a little safety gap right there. For any extra flour, I'm just going to brush it off with a clean pastry brush. Here we go. And here's my favorite part. I love the rolling part. So first I'm going to tuck this over a little. And I'm gonna make sure. And when I roll this out, I roll this out earlier. Um, and marzipan can dry out if you don't cover it. So I made sure that it was covered pretty well with plastic wrap um, so that it would stay supple and easily rolled. Uh, don't get too close to my hands because if you are like me, you have been washing them so much that you don't recognize your own cracky hands anymore. I horrify myself daily just by looking at my hands. So I'm gonna get all that excess. That just makes me so happy. It's so cute. Now, one thing, because you can't touch this, and I can, as I'm touching this, it is really cool. And that is important because, first of all, it made it easier to roll out, easier to handle, but this is really crucial too. I'm going to be slicing this in half with a knife. If this was warm at all, even room temperature, then it would be really hard to cut cleanly. 
So if at this point you feel that your dough needs to be cooled down, just put it on a sheet pan, cover it with plastic wrap, 20 minutes, and it'll be great. So now I'm going to cut it in half, right in half. You can also use scissors for this if you've got really large kitchen shears. Now I'm going to make sure that I don't double cut. I go right into there and get it all the way up. Hi there. And now we have it in two pieces. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to twist them together. as tightly as it will let me. So sometimes I'll go back and I'll do another. And I'm going to pinch these ends together. Now you can see how this could fit into a Pullman loaf pan, just like that. I would tuck this in a little more. Or you can cut it in half and divide it among two pans, which is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go get this in half. And there's always one side that's prettier than the other. That's just life, isn't it? Isn't that always the way? It's like, oh, I love this side, and then not so much. But this is the side you keep, this is the side you give away. Or the other way around. Is that kind of even? Yeah. The other thing about this, the Emile Henri pan, I'm going to say that 10 times today, is that it's a little wider than your traditional loaf pan. So it will make a babka that's a little more squat, because as it is proofing, it'll go out with the pan as opposed to up. So you can see how this one is a little more narrow. So this will be a higher loaf in this pan, and this one will be a little wider loaf. So it's kind of a uh, visual difference, but taste-wise, just as good. So now, before I forget, take those off. I'm going to put these guys in this one. And Ray, do you see any questions? Are you able to see them? He can't, he's going, no, he can't see the questions. Hopefully someone's there. Some of our friends at Red Star Reese are there answering questions as well. So if you're yelling at me right now through the internets, I can, he's checking. Uh, so we, I'm going to now cover this with plastic wrap because if you left this uncovered, then you could not get a really good rise. What would happen is you would get a skin and it would impede the rise and you want to keep it in a warm area but not hot. So I usually, my, my rule of thumb is 70 degrees is as hot as you want to get it. How tall does that pan need to be? How tall does a pan need to be? Well, let's see, I've got a ruler. So it, it depends, right? So this is a narrower and taller so what happens as this proofs, it'll proof up and bake up. And this one is, I'll tell you the exact dimensions. This one is 9 by 4. And this one is closer to, let's see how tall. Do you see how tall? This one is only, like, not even, it's like 3 and a half, and it's how wide? It's like 5 and a half wide, and then how long? Like 9 long. So they're pretty much the same length, but this is a bit wider. So as it proofs, it'll get wider as opposed to taller. And this one being skinnier is just going to rise up taller. So it depends on the loaf pan you have and the type of loaf you want. But it'll bake up pretty much at the same time. So this will take, once it's proved, which will take about an hour, um, the bake is about 45 minutes. And that's approximate. This is another thing that's kind of painful in baking is that the ovens are liars. They are. I'm just going to tell you. It'll say it's 350. It really won't be 350. And then the baking time varies because even if it says it's bang on at 350, the way the heat is circulating changes from oven to oven. So the bake will be different. So what I always do is I make sure that I check for color. And because this takes a while to bake, what I will do when I first put it in the oven, I will tent it with aluminum foil. 
So because there's so much sugar in this dough, it can get dark very quickly. Yes, sir, I'm seeing a- Does that parchment need to be oiled? I did not oil the parchment. You can if you want to, but I don't. That it's, There's silicone in parchment, which keeps it relatively non-stick. Um, but if you would also like to spray, and I usually use baker spray, which is this uh, oil spray that also has flour in it. Uh, to me, that is the best non-stick spray ever. Um, but you don't have to. As long as you have lined it with a parchment, it'll be fine. So I'll start off the first... 35 to 40 minutes with its little tent on and then I'll take the tent off, let it brown and then I'll give it a nice little poke to see if it feels firm and then I will stab it with a thermometer to see what its temperature is. If it's between 190 and 200, you're bang on, you're there. Convectional, conve um, so the question is convection or conventional? And that's really up to you. You know, ovens, you'll know your own oven. Con convection can dry some things out. In this case, since you're baking, as I bake, with a tent over it, that really isn't so much a factor. You're almost creating a moisture environment in there by tenting it. Um, and it could bake more quickly, right? You do 25 degrees lower for convection, but I usually do my recipes for conventional. Uh, and the timing is built for conventional too. So if you do use convection, you go 25 degrees lower and it could bake more quickly. So check it after a half hour and then stab it with your thermometer to check its temperature internally. Cause that's always a good way, especially with enriched doughs to find out whether if it's 190, 200, you're usually bang on. So we're gonna put this in a little warmer area. And then I'm gonna show you a few other things that you can do with the same dough. Now, I'm only making sweet things with the dough right now, but just because it's called honey bun dough or milk bread dough doesn't mean that you can't go savory with it. Someone actually put everything bagel on top. It looked fantastic. You could actually build it with some cheese. So along with, at the very end, you could roll it in some lovely Parmesan, Take it off that way, that would be lovely. Um, Ray and I have eaten quite a few honey buns with, let's say, pulled pork, I don't, burgers, just turkey sandwiches. I think this is a time in our lives right now where carbs are very important, and we've been eating a lot of them. Hot chicken. Hot chicken. <laughs> Ray, just, Ray just made a big thing of chicken, a slab of chicken. Oh, and also I made, um, uh, Popeye style uh, fried chicken and this was the perfect bun for that so really crispy slightly spicy chicken and that sweetness and tenderness of the dough of that bun it is perfect and now I'm drooling a little because I'm really hungry but let's move on we're gonna make another thing with the dough and I'm gonna grab my second dough which I put Ray under my, oh, I put it someplace where I wouldn't forget and I forgot it. So this is my second dough. It's still cool. And a lot of people have been asking if you can make cinnamon buns with this. Yes, you can. Yeah. And this is my favorite kind of cinnamon bun. I just need to talk about what this dough is like. So when I was a kid, I grew up with a German mom and we grew up vegan. So lots of things going on there. So the bread, when we did get bread, was really dark, pumpernickel type. It's called Vollkornbrot. It was just as healthy as can be. It was incredibly dense. Sometimes it was really hard. It was all, it was all not fun. None of it was fun. On the other hand, our neighbors, the Coleman's, always had the spongy, the spongy, soft, pillowy bread. I'm like, this stuff is the best stuff ever. And so when I grew up, now I love the crusty stuff, right? I love the French loaves, the stuff that like breaks the filling, fabulous. But honestly, I am still a child and my favorite bread will always be the softest, softest pillowy bread. And the reason why this one is so pillowy is that there is a technique, if you go see the bake along on the Red Star Yeast website, I make something, it's called a tang tong, which is, this combination 
of milk, water, and flour that you heat up and you thicken beforehand. And, it, and it, what it does is it creates a bunch of starch, a starch load that creates a really supple bread. You cool that down and then you make the rest of the dough with that little bomb of starch going through your dough, keeping everything really soft. And for me, that's perfect for very sweet breads and specifically cinnamon rolls because I like them soft. So when I bake them off to make sure that they stay soft, I, like with the babka, I will tent it. I'll tent it with aluminum foil so that it doesn't get a crisp top so that the, all bits of that lovely bun are soft and supple. If you like a little bit of crust on your buns, I would still tent it, however, at about 10 to 12 minutes before the bake is done, you untent it and you let it get that little lovely brown. But one thing about all that starch in the dough, because you front loaded it with starch, because you have gelatinized it in the beginning with that heat, is that once it bakes off, that crust, as it cools, will get soft. So it will never be brittle. It should always be soft. And the child in me is like, oh, this is the best thing ever. Now, what I like to do is I like to make 12 cinnamon buns from this dough. This requires a little math on my part, or just a ruler, because who needs the math? So I like to cut my buns uh, from the roll so that each one is about an inch and a half thick. So what I do, and I kind of did the math, I'm not going to try to do it again without a calculator. So that's 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I want this to be about 20 inches long because I usually trim the edges and then I'll have enough to make 12 perfectly sized, and they're never always perfectly sized, but isn't it nice to think that we can do it perfectly sized? And this, ignore, just ignore this, it'll happen. And yes, I'm using, this is a French pin. I only use French pins. And the reason is, is because they're great for shaping dough. So usually you're thinking about, when you think shaping dough, pie crusts, because they're round, perfect for pie crusts. But even for this, when the dough isn't perfectly square, you use this part right here of the pin that's curved, and you use this to shape this so it becomes more of a rectangle. And you do that by putting this curved part on the dough and my other hand, I'm lifting this. I'm lifting this up so the pressure is only here and I'll use, ta-da! So then you can shape it that way. Now, what would happen if you had the pin with the handles on it? You would tip it this way and it's a 90 degree angle. It would dig into the dough. So this can be, at first, when you start using a French pin, a little intimidating. Because it is shaped like this, you're afraid that you won't get a smooth roll. But I find, for getting everything perfect, like right here, if I want this to come out a little more, I just put pressure on one side of the pin more than the other, and it is perfect. Let's do another measure. This is truly the elementary school Spectacular right there. I use these in my classroom and they make me so happy because everybody feels like a kid. We have a pencil sharpener too and it's just the cutest thing ever when people go up to, to sharpen their pencils so to take notes. It makes me so stinking happy. Okay, let's say we're there. So pretty long, right? 20 oh. inches. And let's give you, oh look at that, 12. <sighs> Perfect. Now, before I do anything else, I'm going to take some softened butter. And what I did is I put this in the microwave so that it was incredibly soft, and then I made sure that I got it nice and creamy and supple so that it wouldn't harden as I was waiting to play with you. And I'm just gonna brush it evenly throughout. When you have really cold dough, this butter will harden relatively quickly. So just make sure that you get it a really good pass on the first go because it thickens and hardens. And then if you 
pass over it again. Once it's already hardened, it, tends, it could tear the dough. So just be gentle. And this is one stick of butter. You may not need it all. On the other hand, why not use it all? It is butter. I'm not going to worry about these clumps entirely, but if they're too big, I will take them off. Now, if you have any questions, Ray, Ray's going to go check to see if you have any more questions. This is unsalted butter, by the way. You only use unsalted butter in baking. Why? Because each manufacturer uses a different amount of salt in a stick of butter. And we bakers are persnickety and anal retentive. We want to know exactly how much salt we're putting in. So it is so much better to get the sweet unsalted butter and then you know exactly how much salt you're adding to the recipe. On the other hand, I love salted butter to schmear all over bread. I may have been doing a lot of salted butter schmearing recently. It's been that time in life, hasn't it? Where butter and bread are the best things ever. So now I have about three quarter cup of sugar with two teaspoons of cinnamon. Um, your preferred level of cinnamon, totally up to you. Two teaspoons could seem like a lot, but I really like that flavor peeking through. Uh, so first I scatter it evenly. I don't know what that is, that's gonna go away. Get it all over. And I have a sheet pan that has a sill pad on it, but you might ask, oh, do I have to use the sill pad, which is the silicone mat? The reason I, I've been using sill pad a lot lately, because I've just been baking for Ray and me, not for classes, where I would usually only use parchment. And so this is kind of my way of conserving parchment because I am not so certain if I'm going to easily be able to get parchment. Uh, so I'm going to conserve as much parchment as I can to line my little loaf tins and then I'm going to use the sill pat in the meantime. So still the dough is incredibly cool still which is great because oh I just smushed a donut that is so not happy of me. Okay let's do that. And now I'm going to have my serrated knife ready and I'm going to do my little jelly roll roll. So I start by using my thumb and my middle finger to pinch here and to tuck it over and these index and thumb pinch it together. So that first little one, then I come back here and make sure it's really tucked in and I Keep going, making sure it's tight, tight, tight. And every once in a while, as I go, I will stretch it a little. And I'll go back in. And that will give you a tighter swirl, which is lovely. And it will also help you, as you're doing this, you're, I'm, what I do is I'm feeling how thick the dough is in each part of it, because I love it when each bun is exactly the same thickness and size. And that's a great way of gauging because you're feeling the dough, you're feeling how thick each part of the roll is. And I'm gonna stretch that a little. And then I'm going to let it land on its seam. I'm just gonna get rid of that because it's gonna be cut off anyway. Bye bye. But that looks pretty good. All right. So now, I don't know why that's, oh, I know what that is. Now I'm going to have my ruler at the hand, handy handy, and then I'm going to make just little notches without really cutting through yet. Don't yell at me if it's not completely even. And one thing that is crucial too in baking with yeasted baking especially, is taking the time for proofing. So you have the first proof, which is called the bulk ferment, or the bulk proof, where you're just putting it in one big old bowl, and then you're allowing it to rise together. And then once that has usually doubled in size, 
get this over here. Then you shape your dough. You punch it down first, and then you shape it into a log like what we have here, a loaf of bread, obviously, um, or into a babka. And then once you've done that shaping, then you have to let it proof again. And if you don't let it proof, then it won't have the texture that you want from the bread. And it's really easy when you are feeling anxious for something tasty to rush everything along. But it's really important that you don't, that you let the yeast do its thing. And what I love about platinum, and I learned this the hard way, was I had made a, an enriched dough not unlike this. But not only was it enriched with sugars and fats in the dough itself, but I had um, filled it with old school sugar cubes that had been soaked in a little bit of citrus, which is like a very cool, crunchy sweet bun that you can get in Northern Europe. Well, I had formed them, I had covered them, I had them ready to proof, and I stuck them in a, like a rack like this so I didn't see it. And then Ray and I went out and I forgot for hours that they were just sitting there all by their lonesome, scared for their lives, that I would totally ruin these poor buns. But when I got home, there was one of those things, you know when you're out and you're like, something's bothering you and you don't know what it is. It's like something right back there is going, ah, and you're like, why, why do I feel weird? So I got home, I'm like, oh no. Any other dough would have just been like, wah, wah. It would have been a goner, but I'm like, maybe it'll work. So I preheated the oven, which, what, which took, you know, like 15, 20 minutes more. And that whole time I'm having anxiety attacks because I'm like, that's, that's 15 minutes this bread can't afford. It turned out perfectly because all those dough strengtheners were still like, they were totally with it, holding that dough together. They were fabulous, buoyant, delicious. Uh, one of the reasons I love this yeast so much. So you can be a little forgetful with this, but I prefer it that you are not. So now you will notice that I've got these lovely little spirals. And the reason I just moved those back is because this was the very last one, which always tends to be a little smaller. It doesn't look too much smaller, but I like to have it inside the pan, not on the edges, because it will not get as much heat over there. And these will expand some, but just in case, what I do is I just gently tuck that under, and then I press, tuck it under, so that when it starts to proof, this doesn't do what it's doing right there. You don't want it to unfurl. Gently press. And also notice, I always make sure that the flap is facing in and not out. In the event that it does come loose, if it comes loose and it's facing another bun, it will get stopped. If it doesn't, it will just unfold and then get hard and overbake. This is my tiny one. I'm going to press it a little. And do take time when you have done something like this to admire the lovely spiral that is a cinnamon bow. I love it so much. Now, once these are proofed, so it should take about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, they bake up in about 35, 40 minutes. And then while they're still warm, I will mix together about four tablespoons of butter, some like two cups of confectioner sugar, and then some vanilla. And I will add a tablespoon at a time of really hot water, and then I'll stir it until it's the right consistency. And I usually uh, put a lovely icing on it while they're still warm, so it coats everything. Now, like we did before, I'm going to find my, it's right here, it's hiding, my plastic wrap. You wrap that up, wrap it loosely so it has room to grow, but make sure that there is nothing exposed because it will form a skin and then it won't rise properly. 
and it'll get a very tough outside. So again, 70 degrees is as hot as I like to make it. Refrigerators have changed, but when I was a kid, it was usually the, the best place to put anything that was proofing was the top of the fridge. And sometimes it was so hot that I would have to put a bowl, or my mom would, a bowl, and then you would put the pan on top of the bowl so it was just hovering over that lovely hot, hot stuff that was coming off of the, the fridge. But keep an eye on it. Make sure that's not too hot. We have radiators. We have a really old house. So I'll do that now with our radiators. I will like turn up the heat a little, don't tell Ray. And then I will put a big bowl on top of the radiator and then I'll put this on top and every once in a while I'll touch. I have a laser thermometer too that I'll like go zap it just to make sure it's not too hot. Because if it does get too hot, then it could just melt everything and that's not good. There's lots of butter in there. So that's our cinnamon rolls and I have some here that are not yet completely proofed, but they are a bit bigger. You can see, look at that. So they've grown a bit and I can feel them. So what I'm doing is I'm feeling to see how fragile they feel. They feel, see, and I made a little indentation there. And if that sprang back, that would mean that that is not fully proved. But this is looking pretty good because I see the indentation and it is not bouncing back. So that is a good sign that it could go into the oven really soon. Let's cover those guys up again. They make me so happy. I'm going to show you the babka. So this is another babka that I had proving. It's gotten quite a bit bigger than the other one. And so well, let's do a compare and contrast of the two. So this is a babka that had been proving longer than this one. And here is, so you can see how that dough has expanded. So how much larger? It was as thin, this was as thin as this was before, and it has just poofed out and gotten so happy. Um, I like to always have a little bit of dough, especially when it's something intricate like this, like this part right here will get really thick that I can touch because there's so much filling going on here. You still want to get a gauge of the dough when there's so much filling. So you have to be able to poke somewhere in there and I can poke right there. That's going to be ready for the oven very soon. In the meantime, we're going to cover that up. So Ray, do you want to check to see if there are any questions out there in the world before we go into our second oh, our third lovely thing? Quest away. I am here for you. Ray's checking. Why? Find. Any questions? No? Yes? No? Yes? Ray, anything interesting? No. You guys are just mesmerized. Gotta go, back in Gotta go back in time. Well, the other thing that you can make with this dough, among many other things, but one of my favorite things, donuts. I love donuts, and I like a very particular kind of donut. I like the, surprise, surprise, soft and pillowy. If I were going to give it a name, Krispy Kreme. Yes, Ray. Is there a question? a question? Yeah, quest away. Uh, Dee wants to know if you can freeze the cinnamon rolls before they're baked. So the question is, can you freeze the cinnamon rolls before they're baked? Now, when you freeze a yeasted dough before it has baked, it has already started to go through its chemical process of eating the sugars and growing, of gassing out, that if you freeze it when it started to mix in with the dough, what can happen is that you can have about a 30% kill off rate of the yeast. So technically you can freeze yeast because it's freeze dried in its little container, but once you start mixing into a dough, just realize that there will be kill off prior to baking when you freeze the dough. That said, the dough strengtheners in platinum yeast actually protect it much better than a traditional yeast. So you got that going for you. You can also add a little extra yeast to offset any kill off from that freezing. One of the better things to do, however, is to par-bake the product. So that means you get to that point that it hasn't yet browned, but it has set. Then you cool it and you freeze it. And then you take it straight from the freezer and put it in the oven at 350 and then let it get that browning and it'll taste as if it were as fresh as can be, as if you had just made the dough that day. 
So just keep in mind there are different things that can happen with freezing a yeasted product after you've made the dough. Um, and having those protections like the dough strengtheners and the platinum really make it much more successful. So we, we, our time is almost up, but I want to show you one more thing. If I can find it on my rack, I've got so much fun stuff. I have today, I realized that not only can I make donuts, I can make one of my favorite German cakes. But first, let's talk about donuts. So these are not ready to go yet, but I made two different kinds, filled, which would be just a ring, and then traditional donuts with a donut hole. The traditional donuts with, that we know and love with a hole, those proof faster than this because you have warm air that is potentially circulating in the middle and the sides. So just be ready for the fact that these, if you're going to make both kinds, will prove faster. And what you're looking for is for them to be doubled in size and almost feel very tender when you poke them. The other thing that I do is that I, when I punch them out, I always put them on an individual piece of parchment. And the reason I do that is because once you have proofed the dough, it is really fragile. And if you were just to pick it up from a sheet pan, then you're going to start collapsing the dough. You're going to misshapen it. It's going to become misshapen. So what I do is I, I put each donut on an individual piece of parchment, and then I transfer it on the parchment into the oil. And I've never had a problem with that. So that it's perfectly shaped. It goes in. And then I have tongs. And then I take out the parchment and you've got a perfectly shaped donut that doesn't get misshapen when you move it from the sheet pan into the oil. I use 350 to 360 oil. I find that 375 can be so hot that it can almost seize the dough and so that it doesn't expand. So that's my preferred temperature. Also because of the, the forward natures of this uh, dough that, having so much starch in it, once it comes out of the fryer, it doesn't have a crispy top. It's soft all the way around, which is my favorite. And then to turn the donuts, I usually use chopsticks because you can get really easy handle on it. Um, or a spider, if you've ever seen that look like a sieve-like thing, that's great too for taking the donuts out. So that's my trick for the donuts. These are my mom's favorite. They're called Krapfen, and they have jelly in them and confectioner sugar on top. And then today, as I was running around, I'm like, you know what I really am craving? And I'm going to bake this off, and I'll put a picture up tomorrow of it. There is a cake that I love so much called Bienenstich, which is a bee sting cake. And it is one of those very rare cakes that uses a yeasted dough. And what you do is you take a round of dough, and this is an, uh, like an eight and a half inch pan. And I had extra dough from the donuts because right when you're taking out and you're punching out donut shapes, you have extra dough. So what I did is I gently put that back together and I proofed it again. And now I'm going to gently press it. Now that's relaxed so that it hits the edge. And then I'll proof it again and I'll bake it up into a layer. And then what you do is you slice that in half and you fill it with pastry cream. And when you bake it off, you put this lovely almond mixture on top that gets crispy on top. And it gets a little you know, this honey, and it's a little chewy, a little crispy. Pastry cream in the middle. It is such a lovely yeasted cake that reminds me of my childhood. And this is the perfect dough to make that. So if you have childhood memories, or you want to make some platinum moments for your own family, this is the perfect dough to do it because you can do so many things. You can make a caramel butterscotchy swirly bread. And that's like if you made a cinnamon roll and you didn't cut it up at all, you just stuck it into the loaf pan. Oh my goodness, that is so much fun. You can make babka, you can make regular cinnamon rolls, you can make lovely filled donuts, all those things. You just have to decide what memories you want to make with your family and this dough will help you make them. So if you're doing really fun stuff at home, creating your own little takes on this dough, social media, post a picture, do hashtag Platinum Moments so that we can see all the wonderful things you're making with your family. Thank you so much for spending time with me. This video will live on 
both here on this Facebook page, on Red Star Yeast's Instagram page, and their YouTube. So if you have questions after the fact, because you're like, shoot, I wish I'd asked that question, or shoot, I wish she'd even been paying attention to the questions that were coming in, they will be answered. And do not worry, there are people around this country that are working so hard to get yeast and flour and those, all those wonderful baking needs to you. Uh, they're coming your way, just call your grocery store. They are restocking as fast as they can. So don't forget, hashtag Platinum Moments, show us what you're making. And thank you so much for spending time with me today. Take care. <laughs>